Where do we um, stand? So we uh, introduced uh, a measure of uh, a statistical, any statistical distribution. For any statistical distribution, whatever we have, some P of X, we can introduce the mean logarithm value of this distribution, which is S of X. And what we learned that if we obtain messages or measurements about uh, uh, objects from this distribution, that on average, every such message or measurement uh, brings uh, S bits of information. If I take logarithm by two, it would bring me that many bits of information about X. Then we learned a, another quantity, which was a mutual information, I, X, and Y. And this was, again, the rate. Information is always the rate per measurement, per uh, symbol, uh, of which I get information about Y by measuring X, or vice versa. And this quantity is a degree of correlation between x and y. And it's a very important quantity. We already see how it appears over and over, and it will appear even more. And then in the last lecture, we introduced the third, again, the most important quantity that we are working. That's actually then. We already did the summit. We now will go down and we'll apply it, just, you know, cracking. So we introduced D which was a measure of a difference between two arbitrary distributions. These two distributions must be defined on the same uh, uh, ensemble, on the same set of symbols. Uh, and so it, it's a non-symmetric, uh, uh, and it's uh, if S is a mean value of logarithm P, then D is a mean value of logarithm P over Q, but this mean value is computed uh, by uh, using P. In a particular case where we have probability distribution P of X and Y of two uh, quantities, and we uh, measure its difference from a product of two marginal distribution when we say that Q of x, y is P of x, P of y. Uh, in this case, D is I, mutual information. Okay, so mutual information is a particular case, but of course it's just an overlap because mutual information I may consider for different quantities, and of course, uh, relative entropy, as we also call callback labeler divergence, it also could be for any distribution. And what we started to do uh, at the end of last lecture, and what I will continue now, is that we were deriving a very important property. Uh, it's important for many, from quantum uh, information theory to cryptography to other things. It's called monotonicity. And it's something which is a very intuitive quantity. It tells me that if I have P, which let's say has three uh, possible variables, they could be very different from totally different sets. And I measure this difference with a Q, which is also X, Y, and Z. But I can average over Z or not measure Z at all. So I can look just on a marginal distribution, P of X, Y, and uh, compare it with Q of X, Y. This P is just uh, sum over all uh, values of Z of P, X, Y, Z. Remember that. We have a matrix, and if we sum over all Z values, then what will be on the margin will be distribution. And so what we uh, <coughs> uh, uh, claimed uh, last time where we stopped is that if I uh, consider less variable, 
then generally my d is less. It's physically very intuitive. So if you measure less variable, you need more measurements to see that your hypothesis is right or wrong. Because d is the rate with which you see the difference between p and q. And if q is not correct and p is the truth, then uh, uh, with that rate, uh, so we get this inequality. And now I want to ex exploit this inequality to derive some important relation and to introduce even more sophisticated measure uh, <coughs> of uh, correlations. So what now we consider, again, like here to get mutual information, we consider a particular case of Q being product. Let's now consider Q, again, it's a particular hypothesis. Uh, so I now exploit this general uh, inequality to derive some particular case of it. And this particular case will be when q is p of x and some p of y and z. Okay? When there is an argument here, and this is different argument here, I, I use the same letter p, just say that's the probability distribution. But p of x is not necessarily p of y. x could be measurement and y could be stars in the sky. Just, you know, this could be rain and that could be sun. Uh, okay, now <coughs> if I'll just plug it here, so what is it? It's p, x, y, z, logarithm p, x, y, z, p of x, p of y, z, right? So when I do this, it will give me minus s, x, y, z of the whole distribution, right? When I do this, it will give me plus s of x. And when I do that, it will ask me plus s of y, z, right? So this is my left side of it, right? And what I claim now is this is larger or equal, larger or equal. Let's now look at the right-hand side of it. This is now apparently p of x, p of y, right? Because when I average over z, this is just a product. There is a product of two one, one object distribution. So what stands here is <coughs> essentially mutual information, which is s of x plus s of y minus s of x, y, right? So I see that s of x is here and there just, uh, just disappeared. And what I've got as a result is the following uh, relation that s of x y plus s of y z, the sum of two object entropies minus one object and three object. And this is larger or equal than zero. Uh, this is something which is by itself may look not like a big deal. And again, it, it can make a, a lot of sense when you start considering particular cases. But uh, what I now want, I want to interpret it uh, as the following uh, sense. I want to say that if I would consider uh, Conditional mutual information, okay? Mutual information is by itself conditional, right? You remember that when I introduce i of x, y, <coughs> it was uh, s of x, y minus s, uh, uh, s of x minus s of x under condition of y, okay? But now, because I'm introducing the third variable, I want to consider the mutual information of what? x, y? Ah, x, z. Okay, let's do it, x, z. So I consider mutual information between x, z conditioned on y. Okay? Uh, this is s of x conditioned on y plus s of z 
condition on y minus s of x z condition on y, right? But <coughs> now I can also write it this as s of x y minus uh, uh, s of uh, y this plus s of z y minus s of y and here is minus s of x uh, mm, z y plus uh, s of uh, what I could <coughs> uh, plus s of y So I just, every time I wrote a conditional entropy, like a difference between total minus this one, and there is S of y three times. So I see that this combination, this plus this minus this minus z, is exactly what is written here. So this condition is essentially, from the viewpoint of mutual information, is a trivial statement that this mutual information is non-negative. Any mutual information is non-negative. So either there is a correlation or there is none. Uh, but it now suggests me a, a little bit more sophisticated quantity. It uh, tells me, can I now use such objects which are correlation between two conditional on third to uh, disentangle more non-trivial correlation, not between two objects. You remember, I always say, the physicists are simple people. We like, we always think about right, left uh, 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 correlation between two, but some physicists aren't that simple. Uh, and they really, uh, uh, I guess, it was introduced actually not in physics, but in physics, probably Kitaev was, was, was doing much, much use of it. Uh, it's, it's a way in particularly to see some kind of topological correlation. It's a correlation which do not disappear when you start deforming object, etc. So let me show how one may introduce a next level of, uh, of correlation, which is related to three. So if, if I would call it I2, now I want to introduce A3, <coughs> something that would be, uh, uh, in a sense, characterizing uh, the influence on the third variable on the correlation between two, okay? Just like I introduce usual uh, then now I would introduce this condition, okay? And uh, we can now write it uh, and see how it would actually look like. Uh, let me write it from here. So it's um, S of X plus S of Y minus S of X Y minus s of x z, and then plus s of x y z minus s of y z, okay? So this is my mutual information, which is x plus z, uh, z, sorry. Uh, what is it in the one? Yeah, uh, uh, x plus so this is Sx plus Sz minus Sz. And this would be, uh, where is my, uh, that would be plus S of Y coming from here, minus this, minus this, and minus Z, okay? So what it uh, uh, shows me is the following combination. It's uh, uh, the odd order terms are coming here with plus, even though the terms are coming with a minus, okay? Uh, 
And uh, uh, what is the meaning of it? And uh, to understand its meaning, let's first ask, uh, is it now sign definite? So what's this quantity measure? It says there is some correlation between x and z. Just it exists, OK? Real correlation. Now I measure y. Is it necessarily increase or decrease the uh, uh, amount of correlation between x and z? So was this necessarily larger than this or small? They both positive, right? This mutual information. But the question is, could it be that when I know something about third variable, it actually increases the correlation between x and z, or it necessarily decreases, or it could be this is this. What's your intuition? When it's positive, namely that this is larger than this, Right? It sometimes means redundancy. It means this, this is smaller than this. So learning third variable does not actually increase in any way correlation. But on the other hand, imagine that your x is an input. Then your y is an output, which is x plus z, and this is noise. OK? In this case, what is the mutual information between x and z? It's zero, right? Noise is, by its definition, that it's noise, it's independent on a signal. It's just noise. But now, when I know y, is there any correlation between x and z? Of course. Now I know that the sum of x and z is equal to, to known value. Okay? And in this case, this i3 is negative. It means that uh, a knowledge of y imposes correlation on x and z, which weren't there. Okay? Or it could diminish it. And um, uh, so when it's negative, it's, it actually means that it's kind of facilitate. And when it's positive, it means that y is actually redundant. So this is larger than this. When, when I know this, it's. Uh, so for example, <coughs> what I give you example, let me, because I always forget who dates what. So I've just chosen love triangles. Let's say x, y, z are three person, right? And so if uh, y dates x, x, z, or none, which means that it never uh, dates uh, z alone, OK? So now uh, dating states of x and z are correlated. Right? Because if z dates, then x dates too. Because y, y can only date x or x z together. But if I now know the state of y, okay, so what I'm now claiming in this case, so I have x, z, and y can date x, or it can date them both. Uh, this option, or it can date none. Okay, so apparently uh, x and z correlated, but if I know the dating state y, okay, uh, so I have phi of x z, okay. Uh, this is a correlation between them when y is not known, which means that if for and this correlation is, is pretty clear. If I know that z dates, then for sure x dates. Okay? This is, this is a strong correlation. But now if I know that dating state of y, it actually diminishes this uh, correlation. In this case, uh, for example, I know that y does not date. Okay? Uh, then it does not matter what is actually the dating state of z on the state of x. I already know it. Okay? So there is no, no correlation between them which, which, which I can impose by learning one and then telling something about another. 
So this is a case where I3 is positive, and this is a case where it's negative, and you'll have some kind of home exercises. For example, if your uh, car could be broken because, I don't know, a carburetor does not work, or because, um, I don't know, a accumulator, uh, a battery does not work, okay? They are uncorrelated with each other. But the moment you know that your car does not start, then you can say something about, uh, about this thing, okay? And the same is about darkness, rain, clouds. You can invent many triangles in which this thing could be positive or negative. And uh, for now, I, I just leave it like this, but we'll return to it in quantum information. We'll, we'll be dis discussing how one can actually generalize entanglement entropy, which is an analog of unusual information. So entanglement entropy will be quantum object, which tells that you have a subsystem and you have another system. And how much information about this is actually is over there. But at some point, you may be interested to say, OK, you have A, B, and C. And you are interested only in something which could not be disentangled into any pair. You are interested in some information which is totally non-local, right? And it's, it's very often topological information, which is, does not depend on boundaries between these things. OK, so this is a, a more or less a, what I wanted to finish what we did last time. And uh, now I want to, as we are on a summit, we now go down and we'll happily apply everything that we learn. And the first thing that we want to do is to get distributions, because so far we defined everything in terms of distributions. We say, if this is P, then this is S. If this is P of X, P of Y, this is this, this is that. Now, how to get distribution? So you are empirical scientist. You go, you measure something. Let's say that you are looking for distribution, which we would call rho of X. But what you usually measure is you measure some moments, some averages of some quantity. So you have some set of R j of x. And what you know is that if you measure them long enough, you get some numbers. And j runs from, uh, let's just run from 0 to whatever n. And R naught would be just uh, unity, which means that you require that your probability distribution is uh, normalized, okay? Now, given this, uh, what is the distribution? So you measured. Now you need to guess what is the distribution. So far, what we did, we obtained equilibrium distributions in thermal equilibrium, claiming that thermal equilibrium distribution must be a maximum of entropy under given values, okay? Now, R's could be currents, gradients. So we know that this, our system is not in thermal equilibrium, yeah? Just imagine that this is something which, if X is a set of momenta of particles, this is an average momentum, which is current. And it's not zero. The system is not in, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a gradient of temperature that we've got, okay? Uh, how to get the distribution. Uh, could we apply the same principle of maximum entropy to it? Even though we know that it's not in thermal equilibrium. Let's meditate on it. This is a really important point. It's what I'm describing is not something far-fetched. It's what every, any natural scientist does in the lab like every day, right? So you measured things, and now you ask what is the probability distribution which corresponds to these averages? Is there a way to get it? You can say that my distribution must contain all this information, all this uh, results of measurement, and 
must contain the whole truth and so help me God. It's said important that I was write it slowly with my very bad handwriting. What does it mean? Yes. That there is no extra information that is not necessary? Absolutely. But technically what it means? That I need to maximize missing information. I should not in any way assume anything else which is not in this data. Well, it pragmatically makes sense, right? Because any assumption narrows the set of possibilities for further. But on the other hand, this is also just honest, you know, being honest. But what it means nothing but the truth. It means that the missing information must be maximal. And what is missing information? About the system. It's entropy. So I really want you to see how general and trivial it is. So what I really need to do, I need to require maximum entropy, which absolutely universal principle apply to any set of empirical data. That what now engineers, you know, market researchers, whatever people who do this data, that what they do every day for a living, they require maximum entropy under a given set of mean values, okay? So what I need to do, I need to say that if I take rho logarithm rho plus rho r e sum over j with some unknown coefficient lambda j, and I integrate this over dx, that's my functional. So I require maximum of it, Laplace method, right? And when I vary it with respect to rho, I would obtain that logarithm rho uh, is equal to sum of lambda i r i of x. This formula which you have seen many times, and we did it just with different r's, so it gives me an answer. It says that the rho of x is exponent of sum lambda i r i of x. Uh, and of course, it's, uh, we used to write it uh, as 1 over z exponent sum of i started from 1 lambda i r i of x, and z is just exponent minus lambda naught, which corresponds to normalization. And of course, this is a, an integral over dx, exponent minus uh, sum lambda i r i of x for normalization, right? That's it. It is z simple. It is z universal. And uh, now, uh, let's say uh, we'll, probably, we'll probably put it in the home exercise. The problem with the candies in a box, OK? So we were you know, coming to parents, asking in which box the candy. And so as a result, we got an average statement that uh, out of, <coughs> how I call it, uh, Uh, just want to use the same notation, okay? So I have my boxes uh, I1 to N, okay? And uh, I'm asking and in which box J my candy X, and I do many, many uh, attempts, and I find out that this J mean value is equal to uh, R1. And so what now I am asking, what is the probability that in a given uh, box J, this is uh, uh, my candy is, okay? 
And what I know is that R1 is the mean value of J, okay? So my R J is actually J, and its mean value is given by some number R, okay? Uh, so what is this probability? How it depends on J? This is this probability, right? If this is J, there is something here uh, missing, uh, or I did not explain, right? Or you did not focus, right? So uh, this is a general formula, okay? R's are some functionals of my random of, of, of my variable, right? So in this particular case, my variable is j, the number of a box, okay? And I know the mean value of number of a box in which, so in one scan in the fifth, in once in the seventh, once in the ninth, but then I measure the mean value and it's equal to r, some number, okay? But the thing is that the only thing that I know about my distribution, except that it must be normalizable, is linear in J. That means immediately by this simple principle that my distribution must be how it depends on J. If R is linear in X, then the distribution is that's it. It is that simple, really. So it must be exponent minus j with some factor. And you will compute this factor at your home exercise. It is expressed through this quantity, right? But of course, you studied Laplace method, so you know that, uh, of course, this lambdas must be expressed through these numbers, right? So this is, if you wish, is R1 which corresponds to this kind of first moment here. And, and we know how, so this z is also functions of r, well, technically it's, it's written as a function of lambdas, but lambdas must be uh, written as a functions of uh, r's. So if I would, uh, uh, Yeah, so I can say that this is a function of all R's, and what is really the condition if I take logarithm Z, differentiate it over lambda I, this one, right? That would bring R, but average values of R's are equal to R's. So this is the condition by which you compute lambdas through R's. R's are given. Lambdas are parameters of your distribution. Don't tell me you never did Laplace method. You did, right? So maybe it's some kind of uh, obscure, haldeic uh, old knowledge, but bring it back because it's, it's a very practical thing. Okay? And just this simple problem. And then again, if you are having a set of particles and they have kinetic energy, which are quadratic in momentum, and you are given a value of their kinetic energy, which is p squared, your distribution will be exponent of p squared, sum of p squared, which is Maxwell distribution, right? What it tells you that the maximum of entropy under given condition is always exponent of this condition, sum of all of them. That simple, right? And Z universal. So what's special about equilibrium then, thermal equilibrium? What is special about Maxwell distribution or Boltzmann distribution? Because the framework is the same. It's just maximum of entropy under given condition. So apparently maximum of entropy is true whatever I study, what is the probability of current fluctuation, which is a very non-equilibrium situation, right? Or when I'm studying what is the probability 
of a molecule having this momentum at thermal equilibrium. So the difference is not in requiring maximum of entropy. The difference is in imposing conditions. So what are the conditions? What is so special about this condition which we impose at equilibrium? Because now we look at things which you know very well, just from a new viewpoint, right? Information. So what is it that, what are these conditions that we impose which give us distribution which we say, well, they are special. We call them thermal equilibrium. So what are those R's in this case? Average, average energy of particles? Yes. Or magnetic moment. Or uh, average uh, angular moment, for example. But what's so common? Yes. Imagine there is no space. I just have two level system and I don't care about the coordinates. I just care about what are the energy levels. It's not about space. So is a particular, this is true, but this is just a particular case. But I'm asking about this R's. Could be energy, could be momentum, could be magnetic moment, could be magnetization. What is, what is common for all these things that I've, I've called? Okay, let's look from a, a different viewpoint. Equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, is something when we leave system alone, stop acting on it, running currents through it, whatever, right? All currents dissipate, all gradients diffuse. Uh, we forget everything that we did before. But some things are unforgettable. What are they? So you just... Uh, integrals of motion. Of course. Integrals of motion at what preserves? Energy, momentum, angular momentum. Those are integrals of motion. So now we define thermal equilibrium as a state where the things that we know, those R's, are integrals of motion. And they could be very, very sophisticated set. And now it's a very, very general setting. It's not about energy. Or this. this is now you can apply to biological system, you can apply to, to economic system, to other things, right? So thermal equilibrium is a stationary state which is determined only integrals of motion. You remember long, long ago in the lecture two, we derived this Gibbs distribution saying that the logarithm of probability distribution uh, is a linear function, it must be linear function of all additive integrals of motion. Okay, that's what we did. That's what Gibbs did. And now we look at it and say, okay, now this is a part of a general scheme. When those R's are integrals of motion, then it's thermal equilibrium. But otherwise, it's just happily we would have maximum of entropy under some other condition. And when times run, that's if we stop getting information, the information getting obsolete, it's getting irrelevant, but we already discussed it in this dynamical chaos picture, and it's also backward in time. When we had something, I mean, and wanna say what was the distribution of backward in time, again, our information is irrelevant except integrals of motion, because they are the same. So if system is in equilibrium, we can predict its state at any time. Otherwise, generally, this quantity are time dependent, and in your distribution will be time dependent. Okay? This is totally trivial, right? But it's, I think it's very conceptually important. And it's unbelievable how much time it took for very, very educated people to start using it. And I will give you just, there are many examples. I'll give you one recent example. I just was <laughs> a couple of weeks ago on the jubilee of this guy who actually did it, Bill Bialik, uh, the famous uh, theoretician biophysicist, brain. So what do neurons do? Neurons is such a, it's a complicated cells, it's big cells, but they can fire or they can not fire, okay? So this is from the viewpoint of our brain activity, what every neuron in our brain does it has variable sigma, which is, could be either plus or minus one, or one and zero, 
depends how you look at it, okay? Now we have a very powerful measurement technique and we improve it more and more. Then we start measuring these things for like hundreds, now for thousands of them. This last work I've seen is a couple of thousand neurons. You can get just, you know, what you see, you basically picture you see like this. So from time to time, they fire. And then this is a one. This is sigma one. Then you get sigma two. And also sometimes it fires, sometimes it fires other times. Sometimes. It's a little bit different, but essentially, as long as you are, you can say this is one and this is zero, or this minus one, okay? So now what you can do, first of all, you can measure sigma i mean value. Namely, if you average for sufficiently long time, what are the probability or what is the mean value of sigma for a given neuron? And they're different for different neurons. So you get a set of such quantities which are just givens, right? But you can also measure correlations. Namely, you can take sigma i and you can take sigma j uh, and average. Namely, every time that they uh, one fires and another is not firing, you say, okay, it's zero or minus one, uh, if you take it minus one. Uh, every time they both fire, you say, okay, it's plus one. And then you just sum it. It will give you a number, okay? This is some numbers R, I, G. This is some numbers R, I. Now, you look at it and you say, what is the probability distribution of sigma 1, sigma n? You would never measure this. I mean, it's just, you know, we're now in turbulence trying to measure probability distribution of five quantities simultaneously, and it's very, very complicated. Five dimensional space, you need many, many statistics to fill, you know, the, all the beans in all directions. But you can guess. So what you would write here? So you measured this and you measured this. What's your probability distribution? It's a famous nature paper of uh, just well, a few years ago. Huh? Look, I mean, there's nothing but this, okay? So of course, what you write here would be exponent there will be some sigma j with their factors i, j. And then there could be, there must be sigma j, sigma k, sum over j, k, and sum j, j, k. It rings a bell. You seen it? What is it? What is this probability distribution of variable sigma which takes two values? You physicist, well, some of you, right? So you've seen it, what it is. It's Ising model, equilibrium Ising model, spin distribution, right? Well, we usually take nearest neighbor's interaction, namely this J's. Uh, if it's all positive, we say this is ferromagnet. If it's all negative, we say it's anti-ferromagnet. If they are only for nearest neighbors, then uh, it's a kind of a standardizing model, etc. But we can have a glassy, a spin glassizing model where this J fluctuates, etc. Uh, by the way, what, what your guess would be, this J would be of the same sign for neurons or of uh, different signs for different pairs. What I like about this game is that you imagine yourself God Almighty and you are now creating, well, life, right, humans, brains. So you think, what is the best principle to put into it? So if you would be designing, uh, would you put these J's of the same sign in your physicist? Well, God is a physicist, right? So he knows something about what happens when your J's are positive. So you get either a ferromagnet or disordered state. Yes, what you would do? Well, I mean, if you, you need them to be mixed, otherwise you will So you make them different signs. Yes. You don't want it to be ferromagnet, or you don't want it to be anti-ferromagnet, because eventually it means that at some you know, intervals of parameters, you would get into this simple, which is essentially vegetable state of mind, right? You don't want it. You want it to be 
many different states. Okay? That indeed what they found, right? And then they started to say, okay, wait, but apparently me talking to you and you sometimes saying something meaningful in reply, definitely not a two neuron thing, right? So every time you open your mouth, there are many neurons working in it, right? And this is only two, this picture and this distribution is only uh, two neuron correlation, right? It's definitely missing. Let's go and measure sigma i, sigma j, sigma k. They do not equal to zero. They are something, right? But these people, they really knew the information theory. They say, look, imagine that I would measure this thing. My distribution would be like this, OK? This is a distribution, a decent exponential distribution, right? It has entropy. I can compute it, OK? Now I go and I measure z. What it, what it will do to the entropy of my distribution. So I had this, let's call rho 2, and I had rho 1 of sigmas, which was exponent minus sum h i sigma i. So if I compare s1 and s2, which is larger, this I used extra measurements which entropy will be larger, what measurements will do to the entropy? Will it lower entropy of my distribution? It's the same distribution, the same 1,000 neurons. I just measured a little bit more about them, which means that I put extra constraint. I'm still looking for a maximum, but it's now more difficult to get it because I put extra constraint. But on the other hand, I've got some information. And information always lowers entropy, right? So of course, whatever S of x you have, this is a mutual information, and it's always positive, which means that any measurements, any extra r lowers the entropy. So what these great people, uh, uh, there is a reference in the lecture, and I very much, it's not a very long article, and it's beautiful. Uh, so what they argue, they say, look, we started from row one, then we introduced pair correlations, and we dramatically lowered entropy. Then we introduced triple correlation. You can do it. You have PhD students, you have postdocs, they know they are hardworking people, like all of you. They can choose this data. This first real you need to measure, right? But after, after you measured, after you have all the records, it's relatively straightforward computations, right? So you compute three, point, three neuron correlation, four neuron correlation, and you look how much it lowered your entropy because it tells you how much information you've got out of this measurement. The answer is very little. It was really important, right? I'm just telling you about kind of relatively recent discovery. That's really important. It tells you how, your brain, how our brains work. Our brain work, essentially, most of the information is in pair correlation between neurons. It does not mean that what we do is always a product of this pair or that pair. Creating pair correlation, you can create a big correlated clusters of neurons, right? Like in the Ising model, if you lower temperature, the interaction of nearest neighbors, which is always kind of, you know, pair interaction, produce a macroscopically correlated state. Or near criticality, produce really long correlated fluctuations. Then these people ask how we can estimate the size, the typical size in the brain of this maximally correlated bunch, which mostly come out of this piercing. In this, let's look at this entropy of this S2. Of course, when I increase n, the total, where is my n? The total number of neurons, it would be growing. But it is this mutual information between neurons. It lowers it, right? This is why this is lower than this, right? So now you look at this and ask, is this is really 
uh, non-zero only for some neighbors. And neighbors does not mean in a, uh, any special way. When we'll be talking about renormalization group, maybe next lecture, uh, then I'll tell you how not this exactly people, but the former student of this people did the renormalization group for this brain Isaac model. So interacting doesn't mean any special proximity in the brain. The neuron could be here and here. I mean. But anyway, so there are some strong interactions. The answer is that this J are actually non-zero for many pairs, which means that this mutual information is essentially proportional to the number of pairs. So you can see that if I look at my entropy, it has this additive parts, which essentially come from here, and this kind of negative part, which comes out of correlations. Any correlation diminish entropy. Then you may estimate, you measure this only here. You cannot get uh, over there. You cannot compute entropy, really, for uh, empirically. But you can just kind of estimate where you start feeling this term, and it gives you some NC, which I remember right was like 100 something they've got. And then they empirically went and seen what are really, when the brain started to do some activity, what are the typical bunches, clusters, which more or less fire or not fire simultaneously, and it was kind of this number. Okay? So this is something, that's why this work is important. First of all, it applies this simple principle. Second, it applies to a system for which we know next to nothing. Second, it describes very non-thermal equilibrium activity brain. When brain is in thermal equilibrium, it's dead, right? So this is really very non-equilibrium. But just thermal equilibrium Ising model with some kind of, you know, couplings. Okay, so there are, you know, there are many materials in which these couplings have this or that form. Okay, this just shows you how this principle works. Okay, <coughs> questions. Okay, good. So now that you know how brain works, <laughs> it's all Isaac model. It's, of course, one may ask, but what if not physicists went into all this uh, uh, brain research, but I don't know, some other people? They would probably what be not, because physicists know Isaac model, so they use Isaac model, right? But Yes and no, because after all, this is a really very, very natural object, right? So first you, you measure mean values, and then you measure pair correlations, right? And then you measure three neuron correlations, you find out that they aren't that important, right? And, of, and then people come and speculate, uh, okay. Now, uh, I really want to, uh, so this is all clear, no, you okay, right? No, no questions. I really would prefer more questions. Sometimes you ask questions and it's really give me feedback. So now I really wanna uh, focus on this part. I will now discuss Maxwell Demon and the whole story about uh, measurement lowers entropy, right? Okay, good. So measurement lowers entropy, no doubt about it. Entropy is a missing information. Then if you get some information, then your missing information is less, so your entropy is less. Good. Now you ask, does it have a price? Well, in what sense price? Uh, about money, we talk three lectures down the road. Now we talk as a physicist about, do we need to expend energy on it? And what could relate entropy, which is in bits, to the energy, which is in ergs? So what dimensional, uh, dimensionally there are different dimensionalities, right? So what is the factor which relates entropy to energy? What is the derivative of, entropy, of energy with respect to entropy? introduced in the very first lecture, temperature, okay? So we now come to think that if 
everything here was kind of done in a, I don't know, in a virtuality, right? Beats, measurement, etc. They were just, everything here was, was, was measured in bits. But now we say, okay, now everything we were talking about, measuring this, measuring neuron spikes, measuring position of a particle cell, is done at a finite temperature. Uh, what would it mean if something done at a finite temperature? It means uh, that now to any entropy change, and in particularly this I would be interested if delta S, which is also a mutual information, uh, if you wish, so now if I have delta S, I can always multiply it by temperature and get some energy difference. And again, what was uh, understood pretty late, uh, I would say, uh, despite its triviality, is that if you have a system, and this system is not in thermal equilibrium, it has some distribution, rho of x, this distribution changes upon measurement. With every measurement, you can associate change of entropy. But you also know the energy of this system. And you know entropy of this system. And if you know energy and entropy, and entropy is just an entropy of this distribution. It's rho log rho. Distribution could be not necessarily equilibrium. But temperature with which you multiply it and define free energy is a temperature of environment. Temperature is a characteristics of an equilibrium system in which you are. So this now a mental uh, uh, exercise that we are doing is precisely what Maxwell was doing with his daemon. He was considering a system, but the system was in the environment, in the thermostat, and this thermostat has a temperature. So far, we were always, at least until Maxwell, or actually until 100 years, 150 years after Maxwell, we were always saying the free energy makes sense only for thermal equilibrium because it's a thermodynamic potential. Now we say, no, let's try to use it just like this. Energy you can define for any system, whether in equilibrium or non in equilibrium. Entropy you can define for any system. You get distribution, you get rho log rho. Let's put this non-equilibrium system in an environment with temperature and divide F, okay? So this is essentially, uh, and we will be returning to this object over and over again. Uh, and again, let me remind you that uh, we uh, call it free energy because it's an energy which we can free to use for work, keeping the temperature. You remember? This was a classical thermodynamic meaning that it's less than your total energy. Because you cannot put all your energy into work because you need to keep a temperature. But another way of looking at this formula, which I'm promoting with you, is that this is the missing information about the system, right? This is something you don't know. It lowers your ability to take work out of the system. The more you do not know, the more is the entropy, the less work you are able to extract. So now when you do measurements and you get delta S, S of X minus S of X, after measurement, what happens to your free energy? Your entropy is getting less. Your free energy is getting more. Okay, so now you get delta F, which is T delta S. But there is a first law of thermodynamic, which is also the law of energy conservation which tells you that if your measurement, which brings this delta S, right, allow you to increase your free energy, which is an ability to do work, then you need to spend that much work 
to get this delta S if you're doing this measurement under the same temperature, right? So this is essentially the uh, meaning of what Maxwell tried to illustrate. So now let me remind what was actually his framework. He says that imagine that <coughs> I have a, a system which consists of two parts. And then I know that my molecule on 10 to 23 molecule, I know that some molecule is over here, right? How I can use this knowledge, I can get work out of it. Namely, I can now put the wall over here, right? But not only I can put a wall, I can actually attach it to some weight. Because I know that it's on the right. So I attach weight on the right, not on the left, right? So now when it will be going back and forth, and it's a finite temperature, which means that it puts a finite pressure on this wall. And, so, and the pressure is zero here. So it, every time it will be kicking it and giving its momentum and doing work. And all the way until it comes here, which means that it would be T log 2, right? Because my volume would change if I happen to know that it's one half. This is one bit of information, right? Uh, so this is the work I can get out of a knowledge that this is in this part. And then again, what it teaches me is that information has energetic value. You know more. You can do work out of it. But on the other end, it tells you that if your demon, this nice, uh, who actually, uh, uh, let's call it M, which will stand for Maxwell, measuring device, uh, and M in the middle of demon. So to get this information, need to spend as much work, because you cannot get work without spending work out there. OK? Good. Let's make a break, and then uh, look even closer into this demon uh, and do Landauer. OK? 15 minutes or 10 minutes, how much break you want? Sometimes I feel that you're pretty tired at the end. <laughs>